Back when Shimano launched their second generation DI2 product, it came with a piece of tech called eTube. And eTube was data over power lines. So there was only two wires in all the cables and they formed a very simple network. Now, at the time, people were saying on the internet, oh, it's CAN bus. And if you did 14 seconds of searching, none of that would add up because CAN bus doesn't transmit power. It's just a differential signaling. And of course, after making my video about on-off keying modems that does do power over data lines, well, someone of course would say, so CAN bus. Well, I'm here to debunk that. I'm gonna start talking about differential signals and CAN bus's variation of that, capacitively couple them to a power line and send power on that and put a load on it. After that, I'm going to actually snoop on the DI2 E2 power lines with an oscilloscope. And at no point is anything going to point to DI2 E tube tech ever having been CAN bus. When you send data along a wire, you're applying a voltage, but it's really inducing a current. And that current is what sends your data. Now, there are other ways to induce currents. And especially when we're dealing with small signals and very low currents, things like electromagnetic waves from your electronics or motors or any of these things can induce a current in that wire. And for a single end it, you can end up with a summation of the noise and your signal. And if that noise is bad enough, well, it's going to lead to false data, corrupted data, things that just won't work out on the other end. What if we had two wires instead of just the one signal wire? Well, that electromagnetic interference would be inducing current on both of those wires and approximately the same. And instead of sending a high and a low on one wire, what if we sent the opposite signal on the other? So a high on one, low on the other, and then when we want to send a zero, we flip them around. So it's a high on the opposite and low on the other. Well, at the opposite end, if we measure between those, we get A plus noise minus B plus noise. And so those noise, they cancel. And so now we're left with a differential signal. Basically, that's noise free. So is this CAN bus? No. Campus has two main things. And the first is there's a slight electrical difference here. Now with those differential signals, we usually have termination resistors on either end. And if our bus is active, it, we're either in a one state, high and low, or the other state, high and low. And that means there's always current being wasted on that bus. Those termination resistors are just eating current. What if we could get the same benefits of this differential signaling but find a way that most of the time, no current will flow on the bus. Well, instead of being high and low and fully reversing, what if they came together to the same voltage? It's still A minus B and the noise induces the same, but instead of fully reversing, now what we have is the same voltage, very low current. So that's part of CAN is this dominant and recessive voltages. And well, when it's recessive, they're the same voltage. Kind of hard to send power on the same voltage. The second thing is the CAN bus frame. Now I won't dig too deep into this, but there is a very key feature that relies on what we just talked about. At the beginning of a CAN frame is a list of IDs. And these CAN transceivers can both send and receive simultaneously. Now, if they are sending, they're, the bus is half duplex, so they are expecting only back what they are saying. But because there's a dominant and a recessive level, when they're not saying something dominant, well, they can hear anything else being dominant. And that means if one has a higher ID level, well, it's going to trigger to dominant first. And the other one that has a lower ID level that is sending at the exact same time, 
Well, it hasn't induced any current on those lines, but then it can see that dominant one and it decides, oh, wait, I'm someone else with a, a higher priority is sending data. So I'm going to hold off until that CAN frame is done. This is really clever, but also pretty integral to that recessive voltage level. While I have CAN transceivers, I really struggled to get them to do anything once I was uh, capacitively coupling them. They just didn't want to work. So I took a step back and, well, I went back to RS-485 drivers. So instead of the dominant recessive, we are now fully differential. And I built a network with that and it worked fine, just like it should. I capacitively coupled it and it worked pretty well. Um, there was some edge case errors, but I actually cleaned that up with, uh, with some code fixes. Then I applied power to the bus and ooh, this is where things got really difficult. Not even sending current, just power on those two wires. Uh, in fact, using my power supply, I could not make it work at all. I actually had to use a, uh, a lithium ion battery and I couldn't use two or three cells. The higher the voltage, the, it, it stopped working. Even though that, that this was supposed to be compatible with voltages up to that. So then we're on one cell. I hook up a motor and nothing. I can't make anything work. Changing data rates don't work. It's just noise. Sometimes I'll get something through. At that point, I tried every combination of inductors and combo chokes and huge capacitors and well, it didn't work. Basically, you can't capacitively couple CAN or RS-485 to power lines that are actually carrying any current or even a high enough voltage. It just doesn't work. Uh, and I think this is where the on-off king modem had a, had a real strength, even though it was only using one signal line. It wasn't even differential. And that is because I was using a eight megahertz carrier. So I'm switching on and off really fast, which means I can induce these decaying signals onto that line and just detect them of these little bursts. Whereas this, I want it to go high and the other one I want to go low. And then they, they just, they decay because they're capacitively coupled. And if they get too close, well, you're not, you're not going to get a good signal out of it. The differential on the other side will not be able to detect it. And that's what happened. While I can capacitively couple a differential signal onto two wires, most of the time, as soon as we try and carry any power on it, it stops working. Not only that, CAN bus requires a dominant and a recessive. And so if you don't capacitively couple it, well, whenever there's no data, there's no power. So what else is there to do? Well, we can actually look at what DI2 E2 tech actually is and hook it up to an oscilloscope. So what we see is, huh, it's not CAN, it's binary phase shift keying. Binary phase shift keying is, well, imagine you have an AC signal and whenever you're transmitting a one, you just transmit that signal. But when you want to transmit a zero, you actually flip it. And you usually do this at the zero crosses. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing. We are seeing binary phase shift keying, 180 degrees, so it's binary. And it's at a one megahertz carrier if we measure it on the oscilloscope. And then if we actually dig in to like this data, what are we seeing? Well, we actually see that it takes two cycles at a minimum on any amount of, of data it's sending back and forth. It always takes two cycles, which means our data rate is half a megabit or 500 kilobit per second. Electrically, this is binary phase shift keying. And if you search everywhere on the internet with CAN bus and binary phase shift keying or every variation, well, you don't find much. 
The other thing is we just measured symbol rate and based on how the frames are set up, there has to be a single one or a single zero in there. Just, just how it would work out. And I always see two cycles. So it's 500 kilobit a second. Well, the problem there is CAN requires one megabit. So it can't be the same data rate. Getting onto that frame aspect, remember one of the things I talked about is that because of the dominant and recessive methods, the ID is very important. You must be able to detect the ID in order to detect if someone with higher priority is talking. Well, the way any of these transceivers for BPSK are going to work if they're capacitively coupled, you're going to hear your signal the loudest and at no point are you not talking. So you can't see someone else's data coming. You can't see a data collision and back off. So that's not compatible with CAN. And remember that frame element? Well, now we're going to talk a bit about its requirements. Because of all the IDs and the lengths and the numeration and the CRC, those frames are 48 bytes long. And if you actually put data in it, they get longer. So even if we only had two bits of data, we have a 50-bit frame and we we have a 500 mega, uh, kilobit symbol rate with a one megahertz carrier. When I m counted all those peaks multiple times, we have 30 bits. 30 bits does not make a CAN frame at all. And even if I got that rate wrong, like we barely have enough data to tell derailers to switch modes, to go into adjustment modes, to um, they send back data to say when they're in adjustment modes, uh, at least eight bits plus some sort of enumeration. Like the math doesn't work out. There is not enough bits and it never sends these variable length packets that I can see. So we don't have a CAN frame. While it does look sort of like CAN bus and other differentials like RS-485 could be capacitively coupled onto wires. We, there was no way to get it to work with any meaningful amount of power on it. And I used massive, huge, aggressive filtering methods and no filtering methods compared to what Shimano does. Not only that, we also know that CAN bus requires this dominant recessive ID hierarchy and BPSK is just not compatible with that concept. Not only that, we also know that the BPSK doesn't have the correct data rate. And even if it did, the frame sizes don't match. CAN bus is very particular about the frames and the data rate. And lastly, you can try and find any amount of documentation whatsoever, but the CAN bus spec does not even have the words phase shift keying in it. And we know for a fact, it's phase shift keying. So there you have it. We haven't found any evidence that shows any overlap from what there actually is on a bike to anything related to CAN. Different data rates, different symbol rates, different frame sizes, just electrically completely different. Now there is one possibility that the, I think the 7850 or 7950, the very first DI2 system that used a five pin connector, that could have been CAN bus. But E-tube tech, the data over power line, 100% not CAN bus. And with that, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something.